uh, work with these representations uh, since enlightenment, since we have a script. And this is why it's so uh, difficult to see uh, in media, for example, where there is play or not, because we are used to use media as a script, as a representation. And Raoul also made a very good uh, rec uh, um, aspect um, that when you have recorded yourself, you are kind of uh, alienated by your own recording. Yeah, you make a game, you see yourself on TV with this game, and you say, oh, this is me. It's a very important aspect because um, improvisation can only develop with a new means of script with new means of representation, which means that you can record the playing. It's a very important aspect that had you made. You, uh, because this alienation effect of you seeing you playing is one way you can say, oh, am I authentic or not? Which is a completely different question. I'm not going into this. But you can study a process, a process. Because normally, if you go with Huizinga, which said, okay, you have a rules and you follow the rules, this means that you have a no way to follow the process. At this, at this time, he did not have it. But if you look, for example, to jazz musicians, I mean, jazz musician, uh, uh, the jazz music had a development of the whole music history in 10 years or something, or 20. Only because of the medium of a, sh of a, sh of a record which means that I can learn from Coltrane without him being here and also without reading a book about Coltrane. Uh, before, you had to read a book. You had to check the chart, which was a representation of a representation of what should actually happen with Beethoven or whatever. It's a very important aspect. Um, so with these uh, new script media, you have uh, a way to, get, uh, to make improvisation a technology. That's how I call it a technology, which is very, very different from how we use improvisation normally. Normally, if you improvise, it's mostly connected with a must. I, I must, must improvise. I had to improvise, yeah? Because something went terribly wrong. Ah, you know, you have a party and uh, a, a lot of more guests are coming, which is actually a great thing. But you already feel the danger that maybe the Heineken is not enough. So you have to go to some tank uh, gas station and buy some really cheap red wine, which is really awful. And you say, oh, we had to improvise. We got this red wine. It was a really sad thing. But next time I plan better and we don't improvise, we make a great party. Um, this is what I would call improvisation mode one, which is uh, intuitive. Uh, I mean, everybody can do it, and everybody does it. If you don't do it, you cannot live. Uh, you, can, you cannot go through the day without improvising, because, I mean, it won't work. So this is a common sense. The second mode um, is the mode of planning. Planning is then uh, trying to make, uh, 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 to think <laughs> of time. <laughs> it's totally out. I mean, <laughs> when we think, we use time anyway, because y you use time to think. Anyway, but when you make a plan, you think about time. That's the most important aspect. But when you do it, maybe you forget it. So what you do is you write it down, your plan. So what I was talking about, you make a representation of your plan. Once you make a representation of your plan, it becomes a form. This is very important. It's a form. Now, this form tends to naturalize itself. This means you start to believe in the fact that the form was always there. It's something when Goethe, you know, says, oh, if you have something written down like this, you can take it home without any sorrow because it's written down. That's the thing about uh, enlightenment. Yeah, yeah. As, as soon as it's written down, it's true in some kind of way. Now, uh, when you make the plan, you believe in the truth that was never there before. It was completely made up, maybe with some reasoning. Mm -hmm. But this reasoning is happening in a different space than reality. Raoul Hertje was very right about that. You think in a different space than in reality. 
to make a plan. Otherwise, the plan is no plan. Uh, the problem now is that the reality maybe is different than the plan. And this is something that we now realize more and more with the end of industrial time. Maybe I don't know how it is for you, but for me, I make a lot of plans. Oh, for every day I make a plan. Tomorrow I have so many plans, it's great. I go through a day, nothing works. And I'm totally disappointed in the evening. Oh, shit. Ah, the plan did not work. Ah, what can I do? I make even better plan. And next day, bah, shit. So, and also, my, uh, when I was studying, for example, my parents also wanted me to have a plan. So I always called in the evening. Yes, I have a plan. I know. I didn't have a plan at all. And actually, for you, I think it's even more the case now, studying the form of this studying. Coming back to form. This is something you can forget completely. It's just a time span that you are freed from legitimation. That's all. So you can call your parents and say, I'm all right because I'm studying at Artes. Ah, okay. Okay, no problem. There's no, uh, no question asked. What's really happening there? It's creative. Super. Ah, we always wanted to you to be creative. But what happens after the study is how do you earn your money? And that's a really sad question. <laughs> so, and then the, the whole reality turns around. Um, uh, so, so the reality turns out to be some, some process of becoming blah, 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 blah. So in the 50s, uh, 40s, 50s, there was, uh, there was like scientists who thought about uh, this process. The, the cybernetics, huh? cybernetic guys, uh, they found out reality is a process. So what we have to do, we have to make plans that kind of take into account the process. So this means that, uh, the computers and everything, they count as much as they can to make a plan that kind of uh, reckons with everything that is going to happen in the process. Now, in planning and in cybernetics, there are two modes that are very important. They are modes of externalizing reality. This is very, very important. And um, there's some guy that I recommend to you. As I, uh, maybe I, I will mention some names of some guys. It's just not that I try to show off in the way that this biologist said that the more I show off, the more I can kind of uh, say how great. Yes? Yeah. I will try to mention Hannah Arendt. But uh, <laughs> no, no, it's, it's true. But uh, this is a kind of um, hegemony of theory. This is completely obsolete nowadays. But just if I talk about some older guys, it's only the guys. It's, it's, it's just this historical thing. It's obsolete anyway. And, and, uh, and I'm also only talking about it to, as I said in the beginning, it's material for you to check. If you're not interested, you just fu say, fuck it. Yeah, it's not that I, you know, it's, I'm talking about something, I give you some material, and then you check yourself because that's what is happening is your interest. Otherwise, I, everything is, does not count at all. Okay, um, so Bruno Latour is a guy uh, from France who is like uh, checking the uh, science and how the science comes into the world. And uh, he's rechecking how we see science. And he says that uh, um, nowadays mm, we cannot follow this whole teleological uh, ideology of science anymore. Science that goes into the laboratory, before they go into the laboratory, they already know what is coming out. This is the way how they can go to government to get their money for the research. And so it's all written there already. Then they go to laboratory, they prove it, and they give it out. So this is how we cannot get to any knowledge at all. That's what Bruno Latour says. So he says, on ne peut rien externaliser. That this means we cannot externalize anymore. And this also means that when I have a hard time with the disappointment of my plans every day, means that I'm just on the wrong track. That's all. I'm in my externalizing program, and this will not work at all anymore. It worked in the industrial area, maybe where one guy says, I have a good plan, and 50 do it, and that works. It was a great time. It's kind of getting obsolete. So what I say naturally as the fourth mode is improvisation again. In, in uh, German philosophy with idealism, uh, Hegel, uh, we had the mode Aufhebung. Uh, Aufhebung means that you negate something and it comes back on a different level. 
So, and I see that improvisation was negated, kind of, by the whole Enlightenment industrial movement and so. And the important thing now is, I'm not like in the 60s trying to go back to the playing of children, the playing of the authentic. That was the 60s kind of thing. If you do it like that, then you externalizing again, because then you say you have an like adventure playground for the creative people, yeah. But as soon as you want to get out and make it a political aspect, you're out, <laughs> because then economical blah 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 comes. But now this uh, it's it's together. You have to check economy at the same time as creativity. It's all coming together. Otherwise, uh, you will uh, lose track completely. Okay, so for me, it's not negating the whole literal aspect. Uh, that's what I, what I talked about, but, but script is changing. It's changing its materiality, and I can use it, but I'm not believing the script anymore. That's over. That's all. So, the fourth uh, thing is improvisation as technology, is how, how I call it. And uh, um, mm, the definition of it is the const... Uh, is a... Uh, is a... Uh, is... Uh, that's what I said. Just a, it's a lecture performance. It's not that I'm. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's like Prince. I like to repeat. It's a, it's a. So the the sentence how it is a category of imperative or how you want to call it. So it's working constructively with disorder in community. I will repeat it again. But now since you had to listen to so much talk this morning, also I just play it a little bit. an ex example in a very good book by Bruno Latour also, Reassembling the Social. Neue Soziologie von der Neue Gesellschaft. And um, there he has an example for describing something which is uh, basic for the whole improvisation thing. If you are going away from representation, you cannot just go away from representation. I mean, that's the way, that's the problem that the postmodern movement has. Derrida and Foucault and other things. 
which was very important, uh, Derrida, la grammatologie, to open up uh, uh, the new ways of script. That was very important. But um, like for Derrida, it kind of stays in a kind of uh, aporie, in a kind of uh, unresolvable state. Poof. But this is great because the philosopher, no problem. But if you want to do something, uh, if you want to act, um, there's uh, actually uh, the way to try to find a different way to interpret or to reuse re uh, representation. That's also um, why Derrida said, if you criticize metaphysic, that's what it's about, eh? criticize, you, cannot, you can only do it on the ground of metaphysic because you're using the same material and the same words, which is uh, true. So, um, interesting enough then, uh, Bruno Latour says, okay, if we go like that, we have to accept that reality is performative. That's, that's basic. Otherwise, the whole thing does not work for you and me. Mm -hmm. it's, it's performative. It's completely, everything comes about through action. And there are some problematics in this. That means uh, he has five uh, um, uncertainties that are connected uh, to this. W because it then it, it means we don't know what kind of groups we have. Yeah, we, we don't know how the social as group is constituted. Then we don't know who acts. Mm, this morning there was uh, this talk about difference between object-oriented and uh, like uh, community-oriented playing. Like with for, for Latour, this is not uh, not uh, clear. Uh, this distinction, yeah, because um, I will go to that. Uh, the vibraphone plays too. Vibraphone acts too. So, I cannot say that only humans can act. Things can act too. This is uh, essential for, for, for performance theory in that way. This means um, that my action, this is the third point, is, is it's full of uncertainty. It's not that I can say, oh, it's a rational acting, rational uh, action. I think before and then I act. Uh, too late. Same with you have Barcelona, f when you have an interview with Javi, and in the same interview he says, I don't think at all, and five sentences later he says, I think all the time. This is normal for these guys, because what they do is they improvise all the time, so they bring the reflexivity into the action itself. So they can act constructively with disorder, uh, which is improvisation as, as technology. Um, and at the same time, you have uh, certain scripts um, of this, that I said, these recordings, for example, that are also full of uncertainty. This is very important because when you then do research, for example, in the city, you have to reckon that uh, these scripts are full of uncertainty so that you have representational material, but this material has to be reinterpreted and negotiated in its interpretation. It's not uh, there without the negotiation of the interpretation, which is a political aspect. So the example uh, for uh, that uh, um, Bruno Latour uses is uh, uh, one example he uses is a, a woman, a woman who sings, and she says, uh, "My voice tells me when to stop to sing." And he says, "Then Bruno Latour says, okay, uh, actually, normally a sociologist, a very enlightened one, would say, oh, we have to help this woman because she's not enlightened.'" She still believes in some myth that her voice, which is an object, can tell her something. Maybe we have to kind of sh uh, send her to school again or something. Uh, now the point that Bruno Latour is making is that this ability to work with a voice as if the w voice would tell you <coughs> is actually the faculty that you need in order to use the performativity of reality. <laughs> it, and, and so this means it's just not just standing there. Ah, okay. I was there in this lecture of Christopher Dell. He was talking about performativity. Ah, ah. I, I will have a brot here. Ah. No, but it's an active thing. If you don't do it, yeah. Um, it's, if you don't uh, appropriate it, it's it's over. So. Mm, there was a, um, a, a thing in, 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 in uh, do I still have time? Yeah, 
five, five minutes. Okay, so important thing, uh, also German idealist Kant, Immanuel Kant, in his third critique was a faculty of judgment, he called it. Yeah, you have faculty of reason, faculty of verstand, and you have faculty of judgment. Judgment, he said, it's naive that we believe that the forms that we find in nature uh, are already there. That was the main point of Kant. He said, it's so completely naive. We make forms. It's okay. Otherwise, we cannot work. But that we believe that the forms that we make are already there is something that is not working. That was actually the polo political philosophy of Kant. And he brought it together, it's important for you, with aesthetics. Yeah? Because the faculty of judgment is the aesthetic aspect that you kind of find out what rules are happening in a certain situation. Yeah? And this is what Hannah Arendt then later in, the semi in her seminars worked out, that aesthetics and politics belong together. Which uh, uh, in Europe most of the time it's it's completely you know like this. Oh, you are doing art, yeah. But I'm a politician. No, no, no. It's there. It's negotiated how things come into the world. That's how Anna Arendt says. Okay, and this is what you need then for this is a faculty of judgment, and there are two faculties of judgment. One faculty is when you apply rules. Uh, that's who is singer. You say you just apply a rule. It's already there. The second mode is reflective faculty of judgment. This means that you are completely conscient of the rule that's happening, that, that's, that's going on. And um, I will give a very short example now as a practical ensemble on, on, uh, on, the, on the instrument. <coughs> now, uh, a very important aspect, I won't go into that, with, uh, with Husserl, a phenomenology. He started with a number. His first dissertation was on the number. Arithmetic. Okay, and the interesting thing is that he said we have a, a, a Vorstellung, we have imagination of a number, and we have imagination of the number of the things, and the imagination of the sign of the number. So then we bring it all together, and if this means that we can have the same imagination of three things, then there must be a relation between these things, which he called intentionality. I don't want to go into this, but this means he found it out in the number. Now in music, it's even more complicated. Because the number in music can be different things. This is how you improvise. Is a is uh, can be a can be one and a, okay? But it can be major seventh in B flat. It can be a B nine in A flat. It can be a, a normal seven in B, and it can be a nine in G, and it can be all kinds of things. It doesn't matter for non-musicians. It doesn't matter. It just it's just the way how you create it, okay? And then you kind of practice this material in kind of constellations to make this relational aspect of this material work, yeah? For example, I take a number constellation, which is um, uh, three, one, nine, five, three. So, and this is like one shape, but it can move, that is a thing of Bach, yeah? Can move the pin, can circle. Barcelona, the young, uh, the young groups, they always practice with 20 balls at a time. So they when go into the game, they see 20 balls, and this is the same thing. I should play a very short improvisation on this on this motif. <laughs> Thank you. 